Yeah. Mike is going to get them. Well, we're all here. There they are. Uh, do I need to use his middle name? <laughs> I had my dates off. I thought she had one test today and one test tomorrow, and her big one was today, but they're both tomorrow, I guess, is the way it is. So tomorrow is her test. We're going to pray tonight, and y'all uh, pray hard tonight. But she is in a better state of mind, I think. She's, she's feeling a little better, but, um, uh, but this is the big one. So here we go. Uh, thank you for asking about that, and, and Beverly wasn't the only one, but um, tomorrow. Now, I'll let everybody know, or she'll let you know as soon as she finds out. Um, others on our prayer list that we need to mention or update? Do you have any updates on anyone? We've been praying for Miss Gail's son, Jeremy, and his wife, Lisa. Jeremy's got three tests coming up, uh, and we want to keep those tests in our prayers. Two on the 14th, you said? One on the 29th? Okay. Darlene Maddox uh, dealing with a broken leg and that in addition to the loss of her husband um, said food was taken to her and I just can't imagine everything she's been through and going through and certainly in need of our prayers and our our ministering. Uh, Cindy and I'm as Nephew Brian Thomaston has colon cancer, and we're continuing to pray for him. Any updates on Donnie? Continue to pray for Donnie, for Brother Bill, and the Masseys. But there's always, always people to pray for. That's part of what we do. Yes. Say the last name again. I, that's not one I'd heard before. No, Brad. His son passed. How old was his son? Hate to hear that. Got a couple that we didn't expect to see here tonight. Christy is here. And we're thankful and glad. And I see Danielle back there somewhere hiding. No baby yet. Keep her in your prayers this week, too. All right. Patrick will lead us in an invitation song in just a moment. I'll ask Doug, if you will, to lead us in a, in a prayer at the appropriate time. You know, in, a, in the midst of all this craziness that is life right now, housework takes a back seat for us. We do it as often as we can, try to do the best that we can, but don't come over expecting to find spotless floors and a, a perfectly clean kitchen. If I could, I'd pay somebody to clean our house on a regular basis. I have learned the value of that in these last eight months or so. Um, maybe a lot of us feel that way. And that's a, that's a service that people provide. And it's a service that is, is worth what they charge, I imagine. We have a church full of servants here. More than I can name, more than I know, I'm sure of that. And servants in a congregation are the unsung heroes, of course. 
do things that nobody sees, nobody knows about, don't get recognition or congratulations. From the smallest chores to the most important issues uh, to keep us comfortable, to keep us uh, going with what we need. And you all are to be commended for the attitude that you have about serving in the congregation. And that's what impresses me so much about Central. We're a, a church of servants. And, and that kind of behavior, that kind of outlook attracts people. And it will. Give it time. But we'll start, we'll start growing when we have servant hearts across the board. That's what it always results in. And just about every one of Paul's epistles, when he sends his salutation, as he begins his letter, he has a, a typical greeting that he sends to the people that he's writing to, referring to the the grace and mercy of, of God. But he also, in almost every one of his epistles, refers to himself as a servant. And I want us to look just briefly tonight at some things Paul says about being a servant in the book of Philippians. Philippians is the book of joy. It is a positive and upbeat, the most optimistic epistle you have to remember that not only was the church in the first century facing daily persecution whether from the Jews or from the Romans or from uh, other religions even we don't think about that often but but that was part of it as well not only was that going on, and Christians were dealing with that, and Paul wrote to encourage the church at Philippi, talks about the joy that we can have, and uh, the contentment that we can have, no matter what our circumstances are. But Paul was in prison when he wrote this. And it's just remarkable to consider the unshakable, immovable joy that Paul had in spite of his circumstances. And to top it all off, in his mind, he's a servant first. That's what stands out to me in each one of these epistles that he begins this way it's his identity. It's the first thing that he thinks of, and it's something he wants his readers to know right off the bat. Jesus is my Lord. He is my master. I am his servant, his slave. That's the way Paul viewed himself toward Jesus Christ. He had never met Jesus during his ministry while Jesus was alive before his death. But he encountered him in Acts chapter 9 on the road to Damascus. Changed his life. He became an apostle. And, and he had a faith then that turned the world upside down. But through all of that, he was doing it, viewing himself as a servant. And I think that's the first thing I want us to understand tonight. That being a servant is a choice. Paul chose to identify himself as servant first. Now, he could have said, I'm an apostle. He could have said, I, I am a, a, a Jew. I am a, a converted Pharisee. He talks about some of that even here in Philippians. But, but that's not the way he wants people to think about him when he writes these letters. It's first and foremost as a servant. That means... By choice, Paul is thinking daily, constantly, what does my Lord want me to do today? How can I serve my master? It was a choice. 
and he chose to be identified as a servant above and beyond everything else in his life. He includes Timothy here, but in every one of his letters, that's the way he begins. Being a servant is a choice. The second thing I want us to notice about being a servant is from chapter 2. Being a servant is a mindset. It is a, it is a, it's an attitude. It is a lifestyle. It's an outlook. It affects and influences everything that we do. Being a servant is a mindset. It's the way we view ourselves. In chapter 2, he, he tells us to have the mind of Christ. In verse 5, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. And here's the way his mind worked. Paul says. He was in the form of God, but he thought it not robbery to be equal with God. He made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. He humbled himself and became obedient even to the death of the cross. Jesus had the mind of a servant. He came not to do his own will, not to make his name known, but he came to do the Father's will to glorify God. And that's exactly what he did. In Jesus' own life, every minute of every day was lived thinking, how can I serve the Father? And he did that by serving others, by serving his disciples. He could have been a king. He could have claimed the crown. He could have reigned on the throne in Jerusalem. But that wasn't what he came to do. He came to be a servant. So what Paul says here is that being a servant is a mindset. It's a way that we think about all of life. It's the condition of our heart. We can let ourselves be lifted up with pride and put our own wills and desires first and serve no one but ourselves. Or we can choose to humble ourselves as Jesus did and think at all moments in our lives, how can we serve the one that is greater than me. Being a servant is a choice. Being, servant, being a servant is a mindset. And in the third place in chapter 3, being a servant is a sacrifice. It means that we give up things. We give up our time to do for others. We give up our blessings, our material possessions to help others. We use what we have to bless others. Because a servant realizes he's not going to take it with him. A servant realizes the work is its own reward. In chapter 3, Paul talks about those things that he could glory in, he could have confidence in. Verse 4, he says in verse 5, I was circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews as touching the law of Pharisee concerning zeal. I persecuted the church. I was blameless as touching the law. But what things were gained to me, those I counted for loss for Christ, when I was excelling in my occupation and in my position as a Jew, the things that I gained were loss for the cause of Christ. But I gave up all of that. I sacrificed all of that because I am first and foremost his servant. And so, verse 8, I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but dung, that I may win Christ. There are sacrifices involved in being a servant. You know that and you're willing to make them. That's what I commend you for. That heart, that attitude, that mindset. And that's what the church needs. It needs servants. We have a head. We have a leader. We have a Lord. We all need to be servants. It's a choice. It's the condition of our heart. It's a mindset. It's, a, it's an outlook on life. And it does involve sacrifice. But being a servant is the only way to find that contentment that Paul talks about here in chapter 4, verse 11. It's the only way to talk to find that peace that passes understanding, chapter 4, verse 7. It's the only way to have that joy that he talks about throughout this book. 
The life of a servant is the life of Christ. And tonight we invite you to become a servant of Jesus Christ, to become a servant of His church. If you've never obeyed the gospel, that's what's in store for you. That's what Jesus is inviting you to do, to become. A servant of God, a servant of your brothers and sisters. And it is a life that's better than any other way of life. Tonight, if you need to obey the gospel, we invite you to do that. Put Christ on in baptism based upon your faith and repentance. If you have done that, but you need prayers for sin or for encouragement or something you're struggling with, won't you make that known? Come forward while we stand and sing. We will sing and with me please almighty father in heaven we're so thankful for each and every blessing that we received this day we pray father that you continue to bless us just like you have in the past and we pray dear father for those that we know that are sick and ailing in different ways and need comfort need strength and need our help we pray dear father that you will bless our our study tonight you will bless every soul that was able to come out tonight, and you will bless those that uh, weren't able to get here through no fault of their own. We do pray, Father, that you uh, continue to bless this congregation. Let us abound here for many years doing our service, and we do pray that these things that we do and put our efforts into, you will bless that uh, much good will come from them, serving the Saraland area and the worldwide through our men that we sponsor we pray dear father that you will uh, you would just bless our country you will bless our country with with people that will respect thee and respect thy word and will uh, help us find our way back to uh, being a god-fearing nation we ask father that you uh, you bless us each and every one as we travel back home tonight and keep us safe until we return again it's coming Sunday if it indeed be thy will let us be here for a few more days sojourning our lives here and spreading thy gospel and ultimately broaden the boundary of thy kingdom here on this earth thank you again for Jesus and his magnificent sacrifice and himself out of his love and your love for us, we do have an escape from our sins. And we do pray, Father, that we always find and look for that escape. You told us you'd make it readily available if we just look for it. Bless us in our study tonight. Bless us in all things that we do. This is our prayer in Jesus. Amen. Mike has got the handouts that we gave out last week if you need those. Um, we have gotten into the text. I think we've spent more time already on this song than maybe any of the others. And I don't, I'm not worried about it. 
I am enjoying this study immensely already. We'll pick up speed, we'll pick up the pace after we get through this first verse of this song. Um, and to save a little time tonight, um, we're just going to sing the first verse because I don't think we're, gonna, we're not going to get past that, at least in our discussion tonight. But still got a lot to talk about when it comes to grace. So we'll sing the first verse tonight. Marvelous grace of our loving Lord, grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt. Yonder on Calvary's mount outpoured, there where the blood of the Lamb was spilled. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon. started by going through the um, background of the writers of this song, and we talked some then about institutionalism, non-institutionalism, and, and those are interesting and needful topics of discussion as well, but the subject matter of this song is grace. Grace greater than our sin. And last week we spent a good deal of time just really defining grace. I appreciated the, the conversation and the comments last week. I think there's still quite a bit more to say about it. We most commonly define it, at least in the church, as unmerited favor. God smiling on us. When I think of favor, that's, that's what I think of when he turns his face our way. And we don't deserve it. We haven't done anything to put him in our debt. But he does it because of his nature, because he loves us, because of his will for us, to bring us to repentance even. But we pointed out even last week that the way we define grace, the way we think of it, is probably very different than the way most people use that term in the religious world, if they even have a clear concept of grace when they speak of it, it's usually in the Calvinistic view, the idea that this was a movement, something bestowed, it is unmerited favor, blessing given from God so that we can have faith, not based on our response to the gospel, to hearing the truth, not based upon faith that's been created by the word, not based upon repentance, but God based upon his individual predestination of our souls before the foundation of time, giving us a, a movement of the Holy Spirit so that we then can believe, to enable us to believe what we need to believe, and that's what saves us. That's the way they think of grace if they have a clear concept of it because, as we pointed out even last week, a lot of times, really, they just use grace as kind of a catch-all phrase for, for anything. Really, they, they use that to think, I can do whatever I want to do in service to God in the name of Jesus Christ, and He'll accept it. That's what His grace is. I guess we could say it that way. Grace to them is God accepting whatever we want to give Him. And that's not the biblical idea of grace. But that to me, that's the, that seems to be in the conversations I've had with people, uh, kind of their working definition of it. Unmerited favor is our working definition of it. I gave you a, a dictionary definition not, uh, not a religious one, but just this is just one based on how it's used in, in vernacular, in, in common speech. Courteous goodwill. Very similar to unmerited favor, but I think the idea of courteous goodwill implies there's an intent. We do good on purpose 
for others, even when they don't deserve it, but just out of the kindness of our hearts, we can be gracious. Um, and, and we kind of brought up a little bit last week, is it possible to be gracious without intention? Is it possible to be grace, gracious maybe accidentally? I suppose it is. We talked about then, Brother Clifford brought up, the difference between generic and specific grace. And, and that gets us to where we're going uh, in our discussion, especially tonight. Uh, but there is a distinction to be made between grace that's on purpose and grace that just happens because we're seeking to do good at all times to all people and then good things happen because of it that we didn't necessarily intend. And the same is true with God's grace as well. And then I gave you an, another one, just a simple synonym for grace. Help in any form is an act of grace. Something that a, an old preacher once said, told me, and that stuck with me. I like that, but there's a lot more to it as well. And I gave you this as my definition of it. I've come to see grace, biblical grace, as everything that God has ever done in man's direction, from creating the world the way that he did, the universe and the stars, purposefully for us, to giving us his word, just seeing creation is not enough to know God. We can know that there is a God through creation, but we can't know what His will is for our life unless He tells us. And that's what His revelation is, and it's gracious that He has revealed that, that He has given us Jesus Christ, and He has written down the story, how that He prepared from the foundation of the world to offer His only begotten Son for the sacrifice of the sins of all humanity. He's written that down in a way that will be preserved forever, and that is relevant and applicable in every age and in every society, in every nation. And that's God's grace to mankind, that we have an objective standard that creates faith and by which we're going to be judged. But it also includes just the fact that He offers us salvation at all. When our sins deserve death, we deserve Separation from God for eternity because God is perfect. He is completely and thoroughly holy. He can't be tempted. Sin can't even enter His presence. Once we sin, we forfeit any right that we have to be with God. It's only by His grace that He even offers us a chance to be redeemed. And so I think that's that stands, and, and that's kind of the way I use it when I'm preaching. That's what I have in my mind when I'm studying, and when I'm singing this song, that's what I'm thinking about. The things that God has done in the direction of man, intentionally and willfully for our good, that's the grace that is greater than all our sin. And we kind of put this in your mind last week. Uh, we looked at some of those passages, the, all the things that God has given us or given unto us, but um, it's leading us to this question. Is grace conditional or unconditional? Another dictionary definition, I'm not sure if we, if we got to this completely last week. Did anybody see this? Remember seeing this? I know it's on the sheet, but I, I didn't think I, that we had covered this. This is a dictionary definition in a, in a religious setting from the same dictionary that defined grace as courteous free will. In a religious setting, it's defined as, or they define it. The definitions are going to change. They're going to be a little different depending on which dictionary you look at. The free and unmerited favor of God, that includes the ideas that we've already mentioned, as manifested in the salvation of sinners and the bestowal of blessings. Now, this is not explicit in this definition, but I see a touch of Calvinism in this, in this explanation. I think there is, and this is again is based on probably the most popular and common usage of the word, what people mean in the religious world when they use the word grace, if indeed they have some clear concept 
of what indeed they mean at all. It is that idea that God saves us and then causes us to be able to believe and then gives us blessings. So this is, I, I read into this definition, and maybe it's not there at all, but that's kind of, maybe uh, that's just me. I read into this definition that idea of predestination, the salvation of sinners, uh, irresistible grace, and, um, and it's not really based on free will, Calvinism. Mull that over a minute. Mm -hmm. As manifested in the salvation of sinners. And they put that first in the definition. Salvation comes first. And then everything else. Faith, repentance, blessings. So maybe that's why. Just the order that they, they put that in. So that to me sounds like Calvinism. Which when it comes down to it teaches salvation by grace alone. That grace that precedes belief. That grace that precedes repentance. That irresistible movement of the Holy Spirit upon the predestined elect of God. That's how, according to Calvinism, people are saved. Now, I, that, that led me to... I'll put it on the sheet, and we're going to go through a couple of these things here now. Because this is another one of those problems with Calvinism. How can this be true? How can these things all be true at one time? But Calvinism believes in, it really, it began as three solas. Sola meaning solo, alone, by itself. They have these doctrines that we're going to, they're going to sound really good until we understand what they mean by them. Um, but in just in the name, we can get on board with it, kind of. But in, in the way they define these things, uh, we understand it, it's not biblical. But they, it began as three solas. Now it's identified as five. And really these doctrines are set forth to, again, remember Calvinism is a, is a movement of the reformation period where everything they did was in opposition to it was to swing the pendulum to the other extreme of cow of uh, catholicism and so these solas these doctrines are in in opposition to some of the positions of catholicism they believe in sola scriptura the scriptures only now we uphold that we believe that we teach a form of that the scriptures are our only basis of spiritual religious authority, nothing else. There's no creeds, there's no manuals, there's no manifests, there's no confessions of faith. We go by the Bible and the Bible only. And we, we hold that. But to Calvinists, sola scriptura means scripture over tradition. The traditions, the rituals of the Catholic Church they reject in favor of Scripture. And on top of that, you know how loosely they actually hold to the Scriptures only. And they all have their other books, their other writings that they, that they use and, find, and put authority into. So just another one, another aspect of Calvinism that's self-defeating in a sense. Sola Scriptura is one. Sola fide, faith. Fidelity is the idea. And this is the concept of faith alone. Faith over works. The works-based system of Catholicism. You did this sin, you say this many prayers, you give this much money. Just a, an exchange, just a, a works-based salvation. So Calvinism said, no, it's not that. It's salvation by faith alone. Faith over works. We're saved by faith and this is where Luther, I mean Luther and Calvin didn't see eye to eye on everything but they were contemporaries and Luther is the one who called James a, a strawy epistle. It was an epistle of straw. There's no nothing good in it. He had taken it out of his Bible and James talks about being we're saved by 
a working, active, obedient faith, faith and works. But they say sola fide, faith alone, at least faith over the ritualistic works of the Catholic Church. And the third of the original solas that they hold to is sola gratia, grace alone. And that is the idea of grace over merit anyway. And there is a merit-based system in Catholicism as well. You, you can store up good deeds. And um, I don't even know, I think that applies to purgatory as well. You can pray someone out of purgatory. Not exactly how all of that works, but to contrast, to swing away from that merit-based system in Catholicism, they've come up with, we're saved by grace only, sola gratia. And this is the idea that, that is in the tulip um, acrostic, the eye, the irresistible grace. Grace that God brings upon you that you cannot resist, you didn't ask for it, you... <laughs> You didn't even see it coming, but because he had elected you from the beginning of time, you're going to be saved. And, and those were the three original, but now they've added also sola, solus Christus, Christ alone, meaning all we need is Christ. We don't need a priest to stand between us and Jesus Christ, uh, the, the Catholic priesthood. The Reformation movement was opposed to that and... Again, it's something that we can affirm and confirm as well. We don't need, there's one mediator between man and God, and that's Christ, and there's no one between us and Him. He was man. He's just like us. He is our high priest, and we are His priests. So there is no Christ, priest, and then the laity. That's completely foreign to Scripture. So in, in that sense, we can support this notion, um, but then it goes, I mean, I don't know of any Calvinistic churches that have a, a priesthood, but they still don't organize their churches in the way the New Testament prescribes. So uh, they don't take that far enough, I guess. And then the fifth is sola, soli deo gloria, uh, glory to God alone because the Catholic Church venerates Mary, um, worships Mary, and uh, has deified her, basically. Said she must have been sinless to give birth to a sinless Savior. And this is the idea that we should not and cannot worship or venerate Mary in that way. So um, the question that I have when looking at these is how can it be sola fide and sola gratia at the same time? How can it be faith alone and grace alone at the same time? How can it be, how can two things save us only? The <laughs> only faith and only grace, separately and independently. And that, that again just leads us to this question. So if this grace that's, greater than our sin, that's infinite, that's matchless, that, uh, according to Calvinists, it's irresistible. What, what does the Bible say about grace? Is grace unconditional? Is it... Is salvation... And that's what I mean by this. That aspect of God's grace that saves us the saving blood of Jesus Christ, the fact that He has offered it to us. Is there, are there conditions to claim it, to accept it, to apply it to our lives? And, and we do make a distinction in between generic and specific. Some of God's grace is unconditional. His rain and the sun, as He talks about, as Jesus talks about, it falls on all mankind, on all humanity. That goodwill toward man is unconditional. But the saving grace that Jesus uh, offers us, is it conditional or unconditional? Now, we know the answer, and, I, and we talked about that last week. We obviously understand that it is conditional. But I want us to look at some passages tonight 
in what time we have left, even if we have to go into next week to cover this. Because I think this is, this is how we fix firmly in our minds the distinctions between these definitions of grace. God's grace, His saving grace, has always been and always will be conditional. There are conditions to be met in order to receive the blessings that He has promised. No matter what those promises are, the pattern is set in the very beginning. And it never changes. Whether it is God's promise of salvation from our sins, whether it's God's promise uh, to lead Israel out of Egypt, to bring Israel into the promised land, to bring them out of bondage. Whatever the blessings are that God has promised, there are conditions that have to be met in order to receive or accept them. Genesis chapter 4. Adam and Eve have sinned and Cain and Abel are following in their steps. And there's some question about what this means and that's, that's not the point here. We're not going to get into uh, really the context of what is suggested in verse 7 here. But when Cain kills Abel, of course... His countenance has fallen. God knows something is wrong. His blood, Abel's blood, is crying out to him from the earth. He says to Cain in verse 7, If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? If is the conditional statement. If then. I'm saying this as a math teacher. That's what we call those statements in geometry when we have to lay out the proofs. If this, then this. It's a conditional. That's what it is. Here, God states a condition. If you do well, won't you be accepted? If you do not do well, sin lieth at the door. Whatever that phrase might mean, whether there is a sacrifice for sin available for whatever sin you might commit or however you might see that. The idea, though, is there is a condition. If you don't do well, there are still conditions. There's something you can do. Unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. So there it begins. If then, if you want to be forgiven, there's something you have to do. If you want these blessings, there's something you have to do. If you want to receive my grace, there, there are conditions to be met. If you do well, Cain understood what the well was. Yes, he did. And that, that's a good point. Uh, that goes along with everything that we know about the way God was interacting with them at the time. They knew what was expected of them. He knew this was sin. So there's the condition set forth, and that's going to be the case from that point forward. I want us to look at a case before we get to Exodus that caught my attention today. It's not I don't know if it is a perfect application of this. But in Genesis chapter 18, let's go there. Genesis chapter 18. God is going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. But he says, I need to tell Abraham what I'm going to do. Verse 17. Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do, seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all nations of the earth shall be blessed in him? And we know what happens here. God tells Abraham, I'm going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And what does Abraham do? He, he pleads with God. What's he asking for? for Sodom and Gomorrah. He's asking for grace. Sodom and Gomorrah don't deserve this. Abraham knows exactly what kind of people live there. Sodom and Gomorrah aren't the ones asking for grace. 
But that's what Abraham's asking for. You're not going to find the word here. But Abraham knows it. That's what he's asking for. And what does God say? Abraham's the one that sets the conditions. If there's 50 righteous, will you spare them? Absolutely. I'm gracious, I'm loving, I'm merciful, I'm kind, yes. No problem, Abraham. 45? Sure. 40, 30, 20, 10. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because he's already been gracious to them and letting them persist as long as they have. He's been long-suffering with them. He's probably already given them opportunity to repent. Lot has vexed his righteous soul by living in that city. And that city consumes the largest large city. Yeah. You can't find 10 people. And, and I think this example shows us not only is God's grace conditional, it can be rejected. It isn't irresistible. Abraham wanted God to show them grace. God wanted to show them grace. But they wouldn't receive it. They wouldn't ask for it. They didn't want it. Lot and his family escaped by the grace of God. I mean, God could have said, well, too bad, Lot's there. But he allowed Lot to escape. So I think that one's significant, in, in especially as we're contrasting the biblical idea of grace with the Calvinistic idea. Okay, Exodus chapter 15. These will go a little more quickly, but that one, that one just, I'd never thought of it in terms of the grace that Abraham was asking for. Exodus 15, they've crossed the Red Sea. They've come out of Egypt. They've seen the plagues. God has done great things, and this is Moses' uh, victory song. Exodus 15, 26, and said, If thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, and wilt do that which is right in his sight, and wilt give ear to his commandments, and keep all his statutes, I will put none of these diseases upon thee, which I have brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord thy God, that uh, the Lord that healeth thee. This sentiment, this statement, these conditions are going to repeat, be repeated throughout the Pentateuch, throughout the first five books, the Law of Moses. If you do what God has said, God will bless you. He will keep His promises. He will take care of you, God will do what he has said he will do. You have to meet those conditions. Chapter 19, at Mount Sinai, they're about to, I mean, they're seeing the mountain as it is on fire, quaking, these things are happening. Moses is going to go up and get the, the Ten Commandments, the tablets of stone. Verse 5, 19 verse 5. Uh, verse 4, you have seen what I did to the Egyptians, how I bear you on eagles' wings, brought you unto myself. Now therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. I have chosen you. I have selected you. You are my elect in contrast to the rest of the world. But you have to meet certain conditions. There are things you have to do. You have to obey my voice. You have to keep my covenant. And God never deviates from that. Deuteronomy chapter 4. I mean, well, I've got a lot I want to go through, so I hope you'll just sit back and enjoy it because I, I'm loving this. Deuteronomy chapter 4. And we could go through so much of the book of Deuteronomy because that's what he's doing here. He's restating the conditions. It's not a second law. He's reminding them. He's rehearsing it. He's giving the same law to a second generation because all their parents died in the wilderness in the 40 years. He has to tell this younger generation the same thing he told them, setting the same conditions, giving them the same, the same instructions. Uh, Deuteronomy 4, begin in verse 24. The Lord thy God is a consuming fire, even a jealous God. You know what kind of God he is. 
When thou shalt beget children and children's children, and ye shall have remained long in the land, and shalt corrupt yourselves, and make a graven image, or the likeness of anything, and shall do evil in the sight of the Lord thy God, to provoke him to anger. This is going to happen, Moses says. We know you, I know you, God knows you, you know yourself. This is, it's going to happen. Here is what you do when that happens. I call heaven and earth to witness against you this day that ye shall soon utterly perish from off the land whereunto ye go over Jordan to possess it. Ye shall not prolong your days upon it, but shall utterly be destroyed. And the Lord shall scatter you among the nations, and ye shall be left few in number among the heathen, whither the Lord shall lead you. And there ye shall serve gods, the work of men's hands, wood and stone, which neither see nor hear nor eat nor smell. All of this comes true. But if from thence thou shalt seek the Lord thy God, thou shalt find him, if thou seek him with all thy heart and all thy soul. God's grace is conditional upon wholehearted seeking it, not an irresistible movement of the Holy Spirit that you don't even, you didn't know anything about, didn't ask for, and can't even tell when it happens. If you seek the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, when thou art in tribulation and all these things are come upon thee, even in the latter days, if thou turn to the Lord thy God and shall be obedient unto his voice, he doesn't leave out any part of it. Seek him, turn to him, obey him. The Lord thy God is a merciful God. Verse 31. He will not forsake thee, neither destroy thee, nor forget the covenant of thy fathers which he sware unto them. For ask now of the days which are past, which were before thee, since the day that God created man upon the earth, and ask from the one side of heaven unto the other whether there hath been any such thing as this great thing is, or hath been heard like it. That is, bringing them out of Egypt. Even if you turn away from him, and you break his commandment, and you fail to keep his covenant, if you remember and repent... He'll, he'll, he'll receive you back. He'll restore that. But there are conditions to be met. So, I mean, just all through Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, you're going to see that over and over. Joshua mentions it. You see it in the books of history. Judges, First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings. Let's go to some of the prophets. I don't have time to get to the one I want to. That'll be a good place to pick up next week. Isaiah chapter 1. So Isaiah, writing during the days of Isaiah and Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, he's writing before... It's after the nation has been divided, of course. You have Israel and you have Judah. But Isaiah is prophesying even before Israel has gone into Assyrian captivity. He warns them that that's coming and that that's going to happen. A lot of what Isaiah's message is telling Judah before they go into Babylonian captivity that when they're in Babylonian captivity, God wants to bring them back and he will bring them back. But there's conditions. These are the people, it, it sounds to me when I read Isaiah, especially, Jeremiah too, but even more so Isaiah. The people in Israel in Isaiah's day sound a lot like Americans in our day. <laughs> and I think we're going to see that when we get to chapter 58 next week. That's where we'll pick up. It's, it was, it's eye-opening. But here in chapter 1, as he begins this, um, they've been worshiping incorrectly, worshiping half-heartedly. God has not received or accepted their worship, and they don't even know it, and they don't even realize it. They're going through the motions. They're doing it just the way they want to. And God says, 
take them away, I cannot receive them. So he says, verse 18, Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If ye be willing and obedient, ye shall eat the good of the land. But if ye refuse and rebel, ye shall be devoured with the sword. For the mouth of the Lord hath spoken. There's conditions. And he just sets them uh, not, not as specifically as he will later here at the very beginning, but at the outset, that's what he, he sets forth. You've got a choice. If you are willing and obedient, good. If you rebel, bad. I don't have these on the PowerPoint, why I'm not putting them up there, but but this, and I meant to write this one down, so, oh me, now I've got to remember where it is. Yep, okay, uh, back in Deuteronomy, sorry, let's go back there first. But even in Isaiah chapter 1, he sets out, there are going to be conditions. God is going to act. How he acts is based upon how you act. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 30, um, verse 19. Now remember, this is Moses' farewell to the people, and he wants to drive home what he's been saying to them all the time that he's been serving with them and among them. Joshua, he knows, is going to take his place. And Joshua does a fantastic job of leading the people. Um, but he, Moses, being the meek man that he was, knowing the kind of sacrificial love that Moses had for God's people, he was willing to say, God, take me instead of them on, on certain occasions. I, I, this verse to me sums it up better than anything else. Go ahead, Jane. Where am I looking at? Yeah, it does. <laughs> I do it all the time. I think that's right. Deuteronomy 30, verse 19. Correct me if I'm wrong. Is this what it says? I call heaven and earth the record against you this day that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing, therefore choose life that both thou and thy seed may live. It is simply that. It's a choice. Receiving God's grace, His specific salvational grace, is a choice. I've given you the conditions. You know everything you need to do. If you want it, it's yours. If you don't receive it, here's what's going to happen to you. There's nothing else God can do. He has done everything he needs to do. He has done everything perfectly. And that's why God's saving grace cannot be some individual, personal revelation of the Holy Spirit that's different for you than it is for me. Because God has to offer it to everyone on the same terms in order for it to be a perfect, equitable salvation. That's the nature of God. And he says it just simply here. It's your choice. It's set before you. I want you. I love that he starts out by saying, I call heaven and earth to record against you this day. I want you with all my heart and soul to make the right choice. But I can't make it for you. But life and death is a choice. Receiving God's grace, His salvation, is that choice. We're going to be in Isaiah 58 next week. Go ahead and be reading, studying there. Um, but we've just got a, a, a couple of seconds left if anybody wants to make any comments, ask any question. Numbers may not have. <laughs> Um, 
Yeah. You're not going to have a Moses standing yep. before you in close court. All that time, the judges look how far away they are. He tells them in Deuteronomy, there's going to be a time when you ask for a king. And, and God's going to give you a king. And this is the way he's going to treat you. And this is where it's going to lead you. And he tells them, you're going to go into Babylonian captivity. I believe Moses, I think it's chapter 32 there in Deuteronomy, he specifically predicts the Babylonian captivity. But he, through it all, he says, if you'll repent and return to God and ask for forgiveness and trust him and keep his commandments, he'll bring you back. It's interesting, too, he tells them, because Moses doesn't go into the promised land with them, he says, when you get there, you're going to divide into two groups. One of you is going to go on to Mount Gerizim, one of you on to Mount Ebal, and you're going to pronounce God's blessings and cursings when you get there because it's your choice. I want you to be aware. I want you to know what you're getting involved in. God has set conditions on his grace from the beginning of time on his salvational, salvific, I guess they would say, grace and we're going to continue to see that even next week we'll look at new testament passages but isaiah 58 read it and think about how close it models the world the religious world today all right let's have a word of prayer heavenly father thank you so much for your blessings your mercy your grace we thank you for revealing your will to us for sending your son for offering us a choice. We pray, Father, that with all our heart and soul and mind and strength, we will choose to receive what you have offered and to keep your commandments. Thank you for all the blessings that we have in Jesus. In his name we pray, amen.